think like you and I do. This person is not going to make sense. Welcome to JonBenet Ramsey's Sketchy Details Part 19. If this is your first time visiting this channel, I advise that this be not the first video that you watch because you will be rather confused. So I advise either watching them from part one on or just going back and watching at least a couple other ones so you at least kind of know where we're at in this timeline, if you will. This video, along with every video in the John Bonnet Ramsey Sketchy Detail series, are intended for educational purposes only and are not intended for children at all. So number 76 is actually at the request of one of my commenters. In video 13 of this series, where we are discussing the poem, Manchurian Doll, at the end of that video I bring up John Bonnet's um, newest, supposed last known picture of her. The picture originally is pretty grainy and it's pretty dark and um, I wasn't able to mess with the sharpness of it necessarily but I was able to mess with the lighting and got a better picture of what the picture contained, <laughs> got a better image of what it contained. So she is lying on the floor, a hardwood floor, on her stomach and what's behind her, the commenter thought it kind of looked like a black bag behind her, behind her is actually just her pants. She's lying on the hardwood floor um, on her stomach propped up on her elbows and so what you're seeing behind her behind her head is the back of her pants back of her legs and you're actually like seeing her back pockets but you'll notice that she's wearing the outfit that her parents claimed that she fought to wear that Christmas night because she didn't want to match Patsy remember Patsy said that she wore a red turtleneck that night and I think she even said that she put her to sleep in the red turtleneck but yet here she is in the new you know latest confirmed last known picture of her from supposed the night she died and she's wearing the outfit that they said she fought to wear but didn't wear and if you see she the shirt underneath that black vest is the shirt that she was found in the one with the little star on it so I don't know I thought that was kind of trippy but Look at her pupils. Look at her pupils. Those are so big. So big. Both of them. And based off of the overall expression on her face, I don't think that this dilation of her pupils is due to the camera flash or the lighting in the room. I think this is because of some sort of substance. I really do. And lastly, about this picture, I believe the story behind this picture is that this is from Fleet White's collection, supposedly, of Christmas pictures, and that this is from his house. Um, the other thing is, so John originally said, or, you know, everybody originally said that there were no pictures of John Bonnet from Christmas night, but yet, years later, we got this one, and so obviously it's safe to say that there are more. Number 77. So these are going to be a bunch of things from the investigation that, to me, are clearly disinformation and lead to dead ends, whose one and only sole purpose is to divert the investigation. So one of them, the obvious one being John Mark Carr. That's obviously a decoy, if you will. I think the same thing with Gary Oliva. Both of them were just a distraction piece. Also... Jacqueline Dilson, who accused her ex-boyfriend, Chris Wolf, I also feel was a distraction. And the parade float stranger, the guy who supposedly approached John Bonnet's float, I don't think that really happened. I think that is also a distraction piece. Same thing with the supposed running man. There was supposedly a neighbor who said that they saw a man running away from the crime scene early that morning. I don't think they saw that. I don't even think that neighbor is real. I think that is fake. Both of the Atlanta intruders, at two different points, the Ramseys claimed that they had intruders enter their home in Atlanta. I think that both are fake. Also, the boat guy, the guy who said that they, that John Andrew was trying to hire them to kill John Bonet. I really doubt that. I do not think that happened whatsoever. Then also, there was a guy at a gas station in Charlevoix, Michigan, who supposedly, supposedly said that he had unfinished business in Colorado. I don't think that guy really said that either. Then there is the alleged alleyway boogeyman, who supposedly said that they, don't you want to just strangle her, according like to some other 
parishioner of the church that um, Patsy attended. And then there's somebody that said that they saw a truck guy, a pickup truck guy, which was Jack Logan. I think that this whole pickup truck guy and the alleyway boogeyman are one and the same story because the alleyway boogeyman story says that the parishioner or like a friend of the parishioners saw a guy in a truck in the alleyway of the Ramses and he said, don't you just want to strangle her? And like, that's ridiculous. So I think all of those things are like disinformation put on probably by the Ramsey team or just pathetic people who wanted to be like a part of it. So 78 is something that I think could possibly explain why the Ramses were evading the police for so long in the very beginning before they were ever officially questioned is because John was in charge of all of that, I feel. And I feel that John was needed that time to be able to coach Patsy as well as Burke, not so much Burke, more so Patsy but to coach them on exactly what they needed to say and exactly what they couldn't say. If you notice, Patsy seems to not remember a goddamn thing. She can't even remember what she ate the night before. You know what I mean? And it's like, come on. You mean to tell me that somebody that's that uncognitive is able to just have like a normal, if not over normal, extravagant life? Bullshit. That is all she was told to say that she didn't remember a lot of things because she would incriminate herself in some way. And and that's ridiculous. I mean, come on. Sit there and think about all the things that Patsy said she couldn't remember exactly about. She couldn't remember what she bought the kids. She couldn't remember what she wore. She couldn't remember where she was. She couldn't remember a fucking thing. And I think that's all because she was coached. And that's looking at it from the angle of there being no programming in the family. If we look at it to where she was programmed, like the poem kind of alludes to, then that is obviously a big reason why Patsy can't remember anything is because her memories are being effed with and she doesn't remember a lot of things. Um, something else I wanted to point out about that. So John Bonet obviously had been in front of the camera her entire short six years of life. They were constantly videotaping and photographing her. I have a feeling that John Bonet's programming was going to, she was going to be either a pop star or an actress. They do that when they're programming these kids so that they're used to the camera, so that they're good quote-unquote actors, and so that they quote-unquote normal in front of the camera, and that they're, you know, and just move fluidly in front of the camera. I do kind of feel a lot that JonBenet was going to be quote-unquote famous or a celebrity somehow, and that is also why like Gloria Vanderbilt made the art piece on her because these people that were already in the elite circles and these celebrity circles were aware of John Bonet because they knew the plan for John Bonet. So I kind of really do think that. Number 79. So according to a lot of people, including Patsy Ramsey herself, John Bonet was a tomboy. And I think in the picture of her and Bi or her and Burke on the bikes kind of proves that. Look at the way she's dressed. That to me is one of the very few photographs that we have where John Bonet was able to be herself and maybe even dressed herself. If John Bonet was a tomboy like everyone states, then I'm not gonna say that she hated the pageants but having to dress up that much especially the makeup and the hair was probably pretty torturous for her and she had a bunch of crowns and a bunch of trophies meaning she won a lot of pageants she even has like a lot of titles and i know i already talked about this in one of the numbers but i just kind of want to stress this to people i want you to challenge yourself or just think about because i highly doubt anyone's going to really do this but Learn all the lyrics to God Bless America and then choreograph a little dance to it and learn that dance and then master that. And on top of that, master two more songs and two more dances and not get them confused and not miss a step. That's ridiculous. Like, that's really hard. I was in dance when I was younger and it's not easy. And when we had to do more than one dance at a time, I hated it because it was like almost way too much. It sucked. And... She did so many, so I just want people to realize that. Like, I really hate when Patsy tried to downplay the pageants in John Bonet's life because of the work and the stress that she herself put John Bonet through to be in those pageants. I really hate that she said that. It, it, to me, it shows where Patsy's mind is at. Patsy would lie, in my opinion, Patsy would lie about the well-being of her children as long as they looked fine. 
you get my gist? Which also makes me want to say something else. One of the one of my other commenters said something about why would they allow Burke to be photographed with bruises if they were the ones that did it. How easy is it for a parent to say, oh, that's from blah, blah, blah. Like, if it's somebody else asks about why their child has a bruise, it is beyond easy to just, for the parent to just say, oh, it's because they fell, or they did this, or they did that, or it's because of this. Like, don't underestimate that these people, i.e. Patsy mainly, and John, would lie. I believe Patsy lied a lot to herself and obviously to other people. Number 80. So quite a few years ago now, this picture popped up on the internet. Its only backstory being this picture was supposedly found in an apartment that some woman was hired to clean. The woman snapped a quick picture of it and then later on allowed one of her friends to post it online. That's it. That's the only story we get with this picture. I don't even know if it was taken in America or somewhere overseas. Anyway, as you can see, this is some sort of framed shrine to John Bonet with images of individual adult teeth. Who the hell made this shrine and who the hell do those teeth belong to? Now, that alone is super creepy and highly sketchy. However, knowing everything that I know about these sinister individuals and this case really got my wheels turning when I first saw this picture. You may recall in one of the earlier videos of this series, I discuss all these different men that have died surrounding John Bonnet's death, as well as just all these different weird men that came to have some sort of weird connection to her case, like John Mark Carr and Al Gully. But... Now, what I'm about to say is besides the reporter who was murdered in 1997 and the forensic psychiatrist who was murdered in 2019, I believe that all these other men that died or were tied to her case after her death are all part of this horrible industry that I've been intermittently discussing throughout this entire series. We must look at this industry like a well-oiled machine with many different parts that enable this machine to run. When you take scumbags like Michael Helgoth or Gary Oliva, and place them next to John Ramsey for comparison, it seems as though they would have nothing in common and would not be connected in any way, personally or professionally, though we know otherwise. These scumbag type men are the runners, procurers, and the lowly buyers integrated into this industry to do the dirty, risky work and also to take the fall if and when deemed necessary. They kidnap and spy on the children targeted for abduction. They transport and deliver these children during the initial abduction. They guard the safe houses where the children are stored in between placement and purchasing. They find drug addict parents willing to sell their children to the rich man for a couple hundred dollars. They are what is known as the unsophisticated pedo. They look like your stereotypical chomo greaseballs. These men do not know how to program the children and may not even know about the programming. Now, what does everything I just said have to do with that picture? Well, if there was a fear that these men were going to talk, they would be retaliated against and threatened. I'm sorry, but a good way of threatening somebody not to talk is to rip out one of their teeth. A good way to not get caught for being the person ripping out people's teeth is to not take the tooth with you, but take a picture of the tooth. That way, there can be no DNA linkage back to the victim or you. Why not just say, fuck it, and not take the tooth or a picture? Well, because serial killers like souvenirs. I said a while back that I was probably going to make a video explaining how some of the programming is done. I don't think I'm going to make an entire video dedicated to that. I think I'm just going to intermittently throw it in with this series because, I mean, it pertains to this series. I say try to explain because it's so multidimensional that to try and explain it all would take encyclopedias. Plus, a lot of it is hard to say and read, but I'll do my best to try and stick with the programming part of it all. The so-called sophisticated pedo is the type of person that is much more heavily involved in this industry on a much broader scale. These are true demons in human flesh. These are the international organized pedos who seem to never get caught. These people use mind-altering psychoactive drugs on the children. They incorporate masks of all different faces, from dead presidents to Disney characters, as well as costumes like Santa Claus and clowns. 
These demented creatures set up bizarre scenarios and scene settings, like sets of a movie. They'll use different terrorizing methods, all aimed at and adjusted to the child's age once they are drugged, to ensure full traumatization and to destroy any chance of believability should the child not split and try to tell of their abuse. There are different levels, or should I say classes, of the children. There are those who are taken from the streets, taken from their addicted or incarcerated parents, or stolen from war-torn third world countries. These are the unspoken for and kidnapped children. These poor children are the ones who have a much greater number of fatalities, with more than half of them never reaching adulthood. Then there are the other class of children, the spoken for and quote-unquote chosen children. Though these children have a much greater chance of reaching adulthood, they have practically no chance of escaping. I don't think people understand exactly how profitable this industry is. It's a $460 billion a year industry. Anyway... All the bizarre costumes and masks and scenarios have a dual purpose for them. A, it traumatizes the child, especially the younger children, and B, um, it totally takes away any believability. When a child is being molested or abused by someone dressed as Santa Claus, they don't see it as that. They see it as Santa Claus is molesting or abusing them. So when they try to tell somebody else about it and say, hey, Santa Claus was molesting or abusing me, nobody's going to believe them, and they're going to think it's all imagination. Plus, say that they set up a scenario where there's Santa Claus, a clown, and Dad, nobody's going to believe them when they try to tell that Dad's abusing them, because the other two characters automatically cancel him out. Like, they, they're so unbelievable that the third person is automatically given a free pass. And that person, nine times out of ten, is actually abusing them. This includes all of the candles and black robes and the occult aspect of it all. And who knows if that's all just for glamour and to traumatize the kids or make it unbelievable. Or if they really are into all that satanic bullshit. So who knows on that part of it all, but that's also included in this. The McMartin School and the Hampstead 2 are perfect examples of that. Um, Especially, okay. (laughs) You couldn't try your hardest to get a child to memorize a script that is explicit, like what some of these kids come forward and say. But they're not going to remember it in such good detail, nor are they going to be able to repeat the story over and over again without any inconsistencies. These children never had inconsistencies because their stories are 100% real. Rather or not the people were actually doing satanic shit doesn't matter because all the imagery and symbology was there. So we need to really go back and relook at this whole satanic panic thing and with a new set of eyes, if you know what I mean. Thank you for watching and please like, subscribe, and share and as always, God bless. Even on this scale, is impossible to comprehend. To know who murdered JonBenet Ramsey would be to know what world we live in, where we are.